Hello once again, wrestling fans of the world. I am Bobby Munson. This is Ring Respect Radio, and I am joined, as always, by the man with the angelic voice. He is Papa Smokes. How are you doing, Papa Smokes? I'm doing great, Munson. How are all you wrestling people doing out there? We hope that everybody's doing great and staying safe at the same time. And you know what? We want to say once again that welcome to the show, and if you haven't done so already... Go ahead and hit that like button down below and click the subscribe button as well while you're at it. You'll be the first to know about any new episodes of Ring Respect Radio or any content right here on the Video Bros Network. Video Bros Network content is also available through Backbreaker Media. You can check us out on Podbean and through YouTube over at Backbreaker. And speaking of Backbreaker Media, Papa Smokes, before we even get into the main part of the show... Just wanted to talk a little bit about a big announcement coming from our boys in Alberta. The Northern Alberta Invitational Tournament is returning again. Another one going to be hosted, and I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be spectacular. I can't wait to be able to do another review right here on Ring Respect Radio. Yeah, I'm excited too, months. And wasn't that a good time last time? I totally enjoyed the tournament. I totally enjoyed seeing a bit about Alberta talent that i never seen before, and... Uh, Looking forward to part two. We'll uh, check those matches out. Certainly so. So anybody who wants to find out who's going to be involved there, check out uh, online. Check out all the uh, talk about the Northern Alberta Invitational Tournament as they continued to release names that are going to be involved in that tournament. Uh, speaking of uh, local promotions and stuff like that, uh, Papa Smokes, a little known promotion that we are a part of, Prairie Pro Wrestling, even though we cannot host official wrestling shows and bring live wrestling, uh, we got something else in store for everybody. Uh, we're going to be teaming up with the San, uh, Saskatoon Fantastic Film Festival and the Broadway Theatre here in Saskatoon to begin bringing wrestling-based movies and documentaries to wrestling fans. This uh, first one we got coming up is going to be Nail in the Coffin, The Fall and Rise of Vampiro, taking place Saturday, November 14th, 2020, 7 p.m. at the Broadway Theater. So if you have the opportunity, you're a Vampiro fan, or in general, just a wrestling fan that's going to be in the Saskatoon area, you want to come, check out all the fun there. Bob Smokes, it sounds like it's going to be a great time for everybody involved going to check this out and getting to see some of the old uh, wrestling community back and some of the PPW Nation, in fact. I'd be so excited if uh, we could see some of those people at the, at the uh, film festival there. I'm also excited to be a part of, uh, for PPW to be a part of the Saskatoon Fantastic Film Festival. Uh, it's been kind of in the brewing around in the works for a little while, and uh, we're really excited to make this partnership to bring some uh, cross promotional kind of movie style wrestling culture to Saskatoon. And yeah, I, I couldn't be uh, looking forward to it more. And uh, I'm going to be there uh, Saturday night, November the 14th for Vampiro. Definitely so, and uh, yes, anybody who wants to check out more, you can check out the Prairie Pro Wrestling uh, social media sites. You can also go check out the media sites for the Saskatoon Fantastic Film Festival. Uh, definitely check them out, and also check out all of the, a lot of great content that they got over there as well, too, uh, from many of the great, wonderful people involved. It's going to be a great partnership that we're looking forward to. Once again, Saturday, November 14th, 7 p.m., at the Broadway Theatre in Saskatoon. It's the nail in the coffin, the fall and rise of Vampiro. And Vampiro, he's he's kind of a dark guy, very known for his Halloween-y type gimmicks there, Pop Smokes. And that's what brings me to our topics for this episode of Ring Respect Radio. Very excited to be able to, you know, maybe talk a little bit more about uh, some of the classic WCW moments. There's a lot that ties into the old WCW, something we haven't Done a lot of focus here on Ring Respect before, but great opportunity as we talk about Halloween Havoc. We're going to be talking about the new Halloween Havoc from NXT. We're going to be talking about the classic Halloween Havocs from WCW themselves. We're also going to be talking about some of those dark gimmicks as well that I mentioned. And then we're also going to be going and starting the show off right here, Papa Smokes. We're going to be talking about the passing of Tracy Smothers. Tracy Smothers just recently passed away on October 28th uh, from lymphoma cancer, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this was a very young uh, pro wrestler, and I'm going to let you uh, kind of take the reins and let the fans know a little bit more about Tracy Smothers. Yeah, there's another one of those wrestlers who are said to see a pass 
seemingly before his time. He's in the early 60s, and uh, that's just too young for a, a for an in-shape athlete to die. But, uh, you know, cancer is one of those things that doesn't care what point in your life you're in. Uh, it's going to get you if it's going to get you. And uh, we're almost sad to see uh, anybody or any wrestler go, but uh, Tracy's mother is especially sad. Uh, he had been... Uh, he was kind of a, uh, late coming to the wrestling game. He uh, didn't get into the business until his late 20s kind of thing. He was a southern guy from uh, Florida, and uh, he got trained in the biz. Uh, yeah, like I said, his 20s or something like that. A bit of a late start for sure, but uh, he more than made up for that uh, once he became a wrestler. He worked in all kinds of territories throughout the South, uh, including... Mid South Memphis wrestling, which everybody knows is such a famous hotbed of wrestling, uh, the, you know, including uh, Jerry Lawler and uh, and uh, Jackie Fargo, and then with the uh, booking mind of Jerry Jarrett there, they they just they were printing money down there in Memphis uh, in the wrestling biz for a long time. And Tracy Smothers, one of those guys that he uh, worked as preliminary talent for a while there. It kind of took him a little bit to get going to figure out uh, the, the entire uh, wrestling psychology and such. But once he did a tremendous uh, talent, uh, a pretty big athletic looking guy and uh, just a funny dude and a nice dude outside of the ring. Uh, everybody that came across his path seemed to like him. He, uh, he helped a lot of young wrestlers. So uh, we saw this reaction on, social media when he passed away it was really quite unbelievable how many young wrestlers and how many uh independent talents uh spoke so highly of tracy and had pictures with him and, and told stories and talked of having great great times and great laughs with tracy and uh that's the kind of guy that will be missed the most in the wrestling business sometimes it's not about the big matches you have but the impressions you made with the people and the other wrestlers around you Oh, definitely so. And you know what? Uh, interesting fact that Tracy Smothers uh, also participated in uh, Halloween Havoc that we're going to be talking about here on the show tonight uh, back in 1990, uh, where uh, in a tag team match that uh, was cost by our uh, uh, by Jim Cornette himself, uh, somebody that Tracy Smothers worked for over in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Smothers is uh, quite often uh, most famous for being in and, uh, something called the pissed a while there and uh, he often seemed to have kind of a cowboy look to him and uh, he always had a young guns and a young pistols kind of tag team uh, baby face good looking guys that would get the crowd behind them and all that and uh, you know perfect foil for some of the uh, heel, tag, heel tag teams in uh, southern wrestling such as uh, Midnight Express and Arn and Tully and the Powers of Pain and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and uh, then went on to have a, a successful singles career as well. But uh, he, he was also one of those guys that just loved the business so much that he just wanted to work. He, he would do anything. And he sometimes got in the, you know, some people to like some of the matches he was doing. He did some silly stuff, he did some death match stuff. The, you know, it was a little bit distasteful sometimes, but uh, uh, just like I said, pe- people love Tracy, the guy, and uh, yeah, he leaves a void in the wrestling world that uh, that uh, a lot of people are quite sad about right now. Yeah, definitely. So uh, definitely going to be very well missed here in the re- uh, professional wrestling world, and anybody who has never uh, looked into the work of Tracy Smothers, I think definitely should take the time to have a look. Uh, Tracy Smothers, in my opinion, would be someone who's a perfect example of you don't always have to be the top person in every place you go to in professional wrestling. Sometimes you can be that guy that helps to elevate the other guys and stuff like that. There is a place for people like this in the wrestling world, and they can be just as memorable and remembered as your top guys in the business as well, too. Well said, Munson. And so with that, uh, we spoke about it before, Tracy's mother's participating in 1990's Halloween Havoc. So we're going to move on over to the uh, subject of Halloween. Uh, Halloween has just passed us. We're actually just shortly into November here. You know, uh, the world is now maybe a little bit more fearful, not so much of uh, ghouls and goblins, but more so about who's going to actually win the presidential election that's still up in the air. 
But that doesn't matter because we're not talking politics here on Ring Respect. We're talking about wrestling. And Halloween Havoc, known as one of the most memorable of, uh, you know, one of the more memorable pay-per-views on the WCW card from back in the day, uh, really got fans excited. It became a very uh, gimmick-like card where, you know, a lot of gimmick matches were utilized and stuff like that. But, you know, considering the time of year, Halloween, everybody likes to have fun. It was there, and there was still a lot of excitement that came about with the WCW version of Halloween Havoc. And I think we're going to start there. We will talk about the NXT one, Papa Smokes. I said I'm going to do a little bit of a run over of that one here. But let's talk a little bit about the history of Halloween Havoc. And uh, dating back to October 28th of 1989. And this, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was still under the National Wrestling Alliance uh, banner uh, before WCW kind of went out on their own in the early 90s, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, they, I think the first one or two were still at NWA, and then it switched over to WCW. The, the purchase of the company by Ted Turner and all that. But um, yes, the Halloween Havoc is a is one of those uh, kind of holiday pay per view, similar to what WWE has uh, the, the same ones at the same time of year each year. Why not have a scary or halloween themed one at the end of october great idea really there's lots of uh lots of creative things that can go on with that and and they tried to get creative for sure like thing specialty matches and stuff uh, most notably the spin the wheel uh had its uh, genesis in the halloween havoc with some uh mixed results i suppose some hilarity in food and uh, also some uh some god awful stuff went on there too, but uh, we'll we'll get to all that throughout. But oh, we certainly will because it's definitely written down on the list right in front of me. But uh, speaking of that yeah. first one, the very first Halloween Havoc, a very strong uh, main event in a sense, considering the competitors involved. Uh, you had Ric Flair and Sting taking on the Great Muda and Terry Funk in a. Thunderdome match, and we're not talking about the WWE Thunderdome video <laughs> walls. We're talking about a Thunderdome match, better known maybe today as almost a uh, very much like a Hell in a Cell match for modern day wrestling. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of these concepts have been recycled, and uh, for today's audiences, kind of thing. I, I think uh, McMahon, WWE, are much to owning up to their uh, creative borrowings and such, but uh, it's out there for any fan to see. And uh, yeah, uh, NWA and WCW would experiment with various kinds of matches like that before they settled on the Thunderdome. They had the uh, war games with the giant cage with the two rings inside and uh, various other uh, permutations of, of uh, cages with the roof on it and then the little cage on top that might have a manager might have J J, J. Dillon or, or Jim Cornette or somebody also uh, trapped in the little uh, shark cage on top of the cage so that they couldn't interfere and they experimented with various things and that Thunderdome was one of the more uh, popular ones that they ended up uh, using numerous times uh, I believe it definitely so. And one of the great things about this particular matchup in this Thunderdome match is they had a special guest referee, none other than Bruno San Martino. Wow, that, what a big name to get, hey? Especially, uh, he wasn't one much for working uh, NWA or Southern Territories, too, but uh, he had such a feud with Vince McMahon that I'm sure he was happy to work for his competition sometimes, too. And, what a great score to get Bruno for special referee. Certainly. And this, I mean, this first event, too, was just full of tag team wrestling. Anybody that's a fan of tag team wrestling, I mean, this was the card you wanted to go and see. I mean, you had a six-man tag match that uh, featured uh, the Fatu, the Samoan Savage, and Samu, uh, or Samu, pardon me. And they took on the Midnight Express and uh, Steve Williams, uh, Jim Cornette, in their corner uh, that night. Uh, later that night, you also had the fabulous Freebirds uh, as the champions, and then taking on the dynamic dudes, uh, Johnny Ace, Shane Douglas, also with Jim Cornette at their side. So Jim Cornette very heavily involved with the very first Halloween Havoc there. Yeah, I'm sure he was uh, helping them with uh, television production and such in the background too. But uh, yeah, yeah, uh, 
I still like tag team wrestling quite a lot, and I'm sad to see it kind of fall out of vogue in, in current wrestling. You, you don't see a lot of tag team action anymore, and, and definitely never in main events anymore. But in, in even in these days, in the 80s and early 90s, you could still uh, get a tag team with enough heat to uh, go on a main event run, and, and some of these uh, tag teams we just mentioned uh, have done that. Yes, sir. And yes. And then, so we went on from uh, that 1989 Halloween Havoc there and the big Thunderdome match to uh, the very next year, the Halloween Havoc being brought back by the NWA, as we said, uh, October 27, 1990. But this time they took uh, this one to Chicago, Illinois. And here's the uh, big uh, main event and all main events right here. We had Champion Sting taking on Sid Vicious. I mean, there's a there's a name we haven't uh, thrown around. I don't think ever here on yeah. Ring Respect just yet. Yeah, that would have been a tough one at that time. I don't, I don't actually think I watched that match, but I can kind of imagine because uh, Sting was fairly new to the business, he, even in when he was champ and when he was big. Like he was one of those guys that wasn't really a wrestling fan before somebody convinced him to get into wrestling. So. Uh, and he had a lot of learning to do, too. And then uh, Sid also uh, was someone who benefited by having a more experienced partner than him. And, uh, uh, he looked quite good. and Everything was great about Sid and his look. But uh, his, his in-ring skills were, were kind of questionable at times. So, uh, yeah, they did what they could. I'm, I'm sure the, that uh, sold some people into the door, uh, but just on name and appearance alone. But uh, not sure I care to watch that as one of the great uh, title matches in history. Probably not. But you know what? Uh, we want to talk about a really interesting time. The WCW takes over Halloween Havoc next, and uh, the very third event taking place on October 27th of 1991. Uh, this one took place in Tennessee, and infamously, this is where we got the Chamber of Horrors match, which I'm sure was what you were trying to allude to earlier, uh, Papa Smokes, yeah. to some of the, you know, what most people would call maybe one of the worst matches in all of professional wrestling, especially at that time. Yeah, yeah, that was a, that's a funny one. Uh, it was uh, an eight-man tag, wasn't it? Uh, the Steiners and Sting and somebody against... Uh, uh, the El Gante, who was later the Giant Gonzalez, and uh, and uh, well, there was you know, Abdullah the Butcher was in that match, and it, it was a mess for sure. And uh, yeah. it didn't look like it was laid out very well. They they had they had props and stuff which weren't working in that match. Like, do you remember the object of that Chamber of Horror match was electric chair would lower itself into the middle of the ring, and then the the, the winner of the match would put uh, his opponent in the chair and pull the switch and electrocute him. Yes, I do. <laughs> in fact, it was, in the end, it was, I believe Rick Steiner is the one who puts Abdullah the Butcher in the chair and then ends up winning the match that way. Yeah, yeah. The match is just, even with the, the pro talent in there, it's, it's so poorly laid out that uh, some of the spots look very obvious. Some of it looks so contrived uh, they keep showing, I just watched this again, uh, preparing for this podcast, and they keep showing the switch or the, the lever of death or something that it's called that's, that the, you know, that someone will have to pull to win the match. And the, the, the lever, the switch itself is loose so that it's just, they keep showing it, you know, a camera shot of it, and it's in the on position. <laughs> Presumably yeah. someone keeps sticking it back up and it keeps falling down like, it's such a focal point of the match. Like you'd think you'd have that part ready and, and set and to go for TV and just, no, not at all. Like your switch doesn't even work. And and for the finish of the match, when just as you were saying, when Rick Steiner kind of uh, puts Abdullah in the chair, they, you can just see Cactus Jack standing in the background. Like he's obviously the guy to flip the switch, which is kind of weird because he was on Abdullah's team. Yeah, that's but true, too. <laughs> he's standing next to the switch waiting for the spot for long, and, and then he just pulls it when it's done, and it's, there's no, no climax to it. There's no build-up. Like, it just looks completely crappy. I, I do like the image of Abdullah 
getting zapped in the chair. I mean, it's just so tremendously cheesy. I, I kind of like it, but this match is a disaster, really. And uh, I, I remember seeing that in the wrestling mags when it came out at the time, and I was, I was just beside myself thinking, what the hell are these guys doing down there? I, I got to ask, though, don't you th- think that if, you know, one of the companies were to turn around and bring back the Chamber of Horrors match, if this would have happened, say, on NXT's version of uh, Halloween Havoc, that the fans would have gone absolutely apeshit this time, thinking that this was going to be the most fun they've had, because the modern-day wrestling fan would eat this kind of material right up, it, it, in my personal opinion. Yeah, I, I think you're right about that. I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that someone will bring it back at some point. I, I could see AEW doing that. I know that, that the finish of that match with uh, Abdullah bloody in the electric chair and the, the shot they had of that was a little bit controversial at the time. There were some people out there that didn't approve of that and didn't think it was very good imagery or you know, for children and all that kind of stuff too. And uh, so I, I don't know if they would uh, sanitize it a little bit for today, but uh, I, I, I have to admit a kind of sadistic pleasure in that uh, image of Abdullah smoking and dead kind of in that uh, electric chair. That, that, that's, I just like that final image. That, that's pretty good. Yeah. And this, uh, you know, this card that I believe that was on earlier in the night, but the main event to actually build on this card was a match uh, Lex Luger, the champion versus Ron Simmons in a best two out of three falls world championship match. You know, just a regular standard wrestling match to top off Halloween Havoc. But, you know, probably a match that's uh, probably more worth the time of investment in watching. Yeah, I think so. Good. I kind of like that idea of not having a gimmick match for the for the championship match. They had they had done that a year or two before, or it was actually in that first one. Uh, it wasn't the main event, I don't think, but the world championship match was uh, Brian Pillman versus Lex Luger. I watched that one recently. Damn, what a good match that is! Uh, I'm not a huge fan of Luger's uh, work in the ring. He he never really seemed to get it completely, but. Uh, and Pillman was still learning at this point too, but I'll be damned. The guys have a real good match. It's a solid match. It's uh, their agents and their booking really went over that one with them, and the the boys turned out a good match. But uh, yeah, uh, Luger versus Simmons too. There's a couple of big powerhouses, and uh, if you can lay them out a good match, uh, it'll look real good with those two. And here's another one on the card, and this one's just a fun one to mention, Papa Smokes. The singles match for the WCW World Television Championship at a couple of young faces at the time. Steve Austin, the champion, taking on Dustin Rhodes. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. If people only knew when they watched that one, hey, where those guys were headed. Better yet, uh, if they would have watched at the time and got to see Steve Austin when he still had those long golden locks of hair on his head as well. Yeah, quite a handsome man. Definitely so. Became part of the Hollywood hunks as a result. <laughs> so Halloween Havoc from there, 1991, moved on to the 1992 event. Uh, in 1992, this was a match build between Sting and Jake Roberts in the main event. Now this, on paper, I mean, at the time, I say has got to be a match that I'm I would have wanted to be heavily invested in. Until you find out that this is the year that they do spin the wheel, make the deal, and spin the wheel, make the deal. Yeah. Unfortunately, brought us the coal miners glove match. Oh yeah, yeah. So, that was a good one. That, yeah, that was one of the that was one of the first on the pole style of matches where uh, the uh, heavy the uh, heavy work glove would be uh, put up on the pole and then whoever could get it first could legally use it on their opponent. And uh, yeah, I wonder where that one came up from. The, that, that's got to be an old uh, Southern innovation there too, talking about coal mining, maybe uh, maybe the, down in uh, the Carolinas or Virginia or something. I'm sure some promoter came up with that uh, back in the 50s or 60s or something. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's another gimmick match. Uh, uh, I suppose there are probably be, there have probably been some good ones in the past, but uh, yeah, yeah, they they they're gonna fill up Halloween havoc with all kinds of wild matches for sure. 
Certainly. And yeah, they've usually got them in handfuls as it moves along. I mean, earlier on in these events, there was a lot more like just straight up tag team and singles events, which was nice to see and everything. Not too much heavy on the gimmicks. But, you know, as we both know, as we got to the later 90s and stuff like that, that's when wrestling started to become more heavy gimmick like. And that's where it uh, kind of takes off from there. Uh, 1993's Halloween Havoc, uh, this one uh, saw another kind of a bigger match. Uh, Big Van Vader, who, you know, I mean, personally, we uh, another guy we haven't talked a lot about on the show, but I got to say that I definitely was a fan of uh, some of Vader's work and his matches. I enjoyed a lot of what he did. And this one was a Texas death match against Cactus Jack. Yeah, yeah, the, definitely one of the uh, big classics of the whole Halloween Havoc series. Uh, everybody remembers that one. Spin the wheel, make the deal, whole thing, and uh, yeah, what a match. Uh, two workers just made for each other. Uh, 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 Vader the Mastodon, just heavy on the offense and uh, working real stiff. Uh, he he was trained in Minnesota to... Uh, to uh, work kind of a stiffer, rougher style, and they wanted that out of the big guy. And then uh, Cactus Jack, ultimate bumper, the guy that, that would make you look so good in your offense. Uh, then they just put on a classic, and there's some truly, truly uh, wince-worthy moments for some of the violence that goes on in that match, but uh, good stuff. And they had the audience eating out of their hand during that one. Oh, certainly. And then uh, you look at this card, it's funny we mentioned it before about Steve Austin and Dustin Rhodes. Again, in a matchup on this Halloween Havoc, this time Dustin Rhodes, the WCW United States Heavyweight Championship, taking on Steve Austin. So roles reversed this time, Dustin Rhodes going in as the champion to take on Steve Austin and continuing a feud that sounds like it went on for quite some time between the two of them. Well, yeah, I can just imagine, too, uh, I can imagine the promoters just seeing the first uh, match between those two and thinking, good God, we got a couple of great workers here, and uh, these guys have chemistry together, and these guys are both going to be stars eventually, so, uh, uh, yeah, I imagine that that's their first encounter on Halloween Havoc was well-received, so... Uh, you know, throughout the year, the championship changed hands, and now we can have this match again, but with uh, the opposite challenge, challenger and champion. So uh, a win-win situation all the way. Uh, the promoter's just counting his money after a great matchup like that. Yes, sir. And then from there, Halloween Havoc moved into the era of Hulkamania running wild on WCW. <laughs> it was time for Hogan every single year on WCW for the next long while because hey, why not? Hulk Hogan was the man and he brought money into companies. Uh, starting with Halloween Havoc in 1994, build with Hulk Hogan, the champion, taking on Ric Flair. Steel cage match for the WCW Championship with Mr. T as the guest referee on that one, Bob Smokes. Oh, wow. They're really uh, trying to reprise uh, WWE famous matches at that time, eh? And we'll see a few more of these as we go through uh, Halloween Havoc and and uh, WCW in general, but uh, yeah, yeah, uh, just just the match we needed to, and uh, to we needed this one again, and uh, and uh, I was also thinking about some of the uh, other uh, WWF moments that they were uh, using again too. I mean, like well, at one point we get to Hogan versus Ultimate Warrior two. Yes, like, we there's, do. <laughs> there's the. There's the match we never knew we needed. Like, my God, that first one's so tremendously crappy. And this one's even worse. Uh, uh, they just look lost out there. And, and I, I really like, I really think that uh, uh, I, I'm not a great Hulk Hogan fan, but the, the guy knew the business. Like, he came up in the old days and he knew. But that's why I think that these matches were booked and agented sloppily because. Uh, the guys didn't know where they were supposed to be and there were missed spots and there were botches and and then the, do you remember the end of that one months and the hogan throws the fire into the warrior's he, face but yeah he does that he pulls that one off so clumsily too that it looks real crappy and doesn't even go near his face like yeah yeah that one was just not going to be a classic part two either 
Well, and even the fire in the face, if I'm not mistaken, comes across like a, a stolen idea from the exploding camera fire in the face that Hogan received at the King of the Ring when going up against Yokozuna for the championship back in the early 90s before making his run over to WCW there. Yeah, that fire throwing is even way older than that, too. Uh, the, the Sheik used to do that in, in Detroit in the 60s and 70s. Uh, even guys like Jerry Lawler used to do that in the Memphis territory. And uh, yeah, there's a whole art to it, but uh, I, I don't think Hogan was a master of that art yet. <laughs> but you know. But you know what Hulk Hogan did become a master of? It he showed it at the 1995's Halloween Havoc. He became the master of the monster truck match. Him versus the giant in the infamous monster truck match. Yeah, I couldn't wait to get to this one. And another one I remember at the time just shaking my head like, what in the living fuck are these guys doing now? <laughs> What did you did you watch it recently, Munson? What did you think of it? I had, to, I mean, I remember watching this as a kid too, and uh, I mean, even back then, I really just, I, I, I would sit there and wonder why this was happening. Like, I kind of just wanted to get down to the wrestling most of the time. I didn't really yeah. care to watch the guys pushing each other in a, you know, a couple monster trucks. I mean, if I wanted to watch monster trucks, I'll go watch professionals deal with monster trucks. I'm not going to turn on my fucking wrestling channel in order to go watch a monster truck rally. Yeah, yeah, and that was, that was, I think, the first, well, I don't know, I guess we could say the first sort of cinematic wrestling moment where they kind of tried to make it look like one of the wrestlers might have died in this. Yeah. Like when Hogan's truck pushes the big shows off the edge of the building and the way the commentators sell it, like, oh, my God, he's gone off the side of the building and all that kind of stuff. It's I just was left like, are you kidding me, man? Like, like you, you actually expect us to believe that maybe he's dead. But Okay, well, maybe he's dead or maybe he's injured. No, he just shows up later in the same paper. <laughs> you just walk around like nothing happened, not a goddamn scratch on him, and no explanation as to what happened. And, man, like, you know that it was Vince Russo and some of his cronies uh, uh, booking that stuff and just – trying to make a funny movie or trying to make a funny TV show and not worried about the wrestling and not worried about the continuity of story or psychology or anything like that. Just passing around to try and get a few laughs and not caring about the consequences. Yeah. And like you said, and only, you know, one short match in between the, in between that monster truck match. And then you had your main event, which was the giant with the uh, taskmaster, which AKA Kevin Sullivan uh, took on Hulk Hogan, who had Jimmy Hart in his corner. And this ended up, uh, you know, just, yeah, basically underselling the idea that they might have just killed this giant, and he comes walking right back out like nothing ever happened. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, like, I, I don't, I'm speechless about some of these things. Uh, uh, I, I realize that fans... No, and 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 the the cat is out of the bag to a certain extent, but just have it, just not caring about the continuity like that. It's just it's insulting, you know, especially on a on a pay per view too. Uh, you got to tie up the loose ends and make sure everything's perfect. Like they, that was the problem with WCW, as far as I can tell, was that they had so much talent there. They had uh, they had booking talent. They had all kinds of uh, uh, good office people and everything. They had all kinds of wrestling talent. They had all the talent for a while there, but it was just that. It was a bunch of chickens running around with their heads cut off and, and no one was leading. And, uh, you had guys signing big money contracts where they have, uh, have it written in that they have some creative control. So they're trying to book their own matches and then somebody else has got an idea for something else. And, somebody's crying to the network so the network boss is coming down and changing things and it was just a bloody mess and uh and uh, he, in researching for this too i was reading about some of how much of these halloween havoc cards and, and just their general uh cards and uh pay-per-views at the time there were so many no-shows because guys were just getting absolutely sick of it and uh not getting their guarantees and not getting their money and not getting their creative and, and uh, just uh, 
yeah, just saying I'm done with this crap. Like I'm out of here. And, uh, you know, that doesn't help matters anyway. And, uh, they got a scramble to uh, complete booking and some of the angles got thrown out the window because of, uh, people abruptly leaving the company. And yeah, it was just a shit show at that time. Oh, it was. Yes. And, you know, we talked about like their, their style of booking and stuff like that. And, you know, got to kind of bring it on repetitiveness and everything but you know bring in rehashing old ideas and stuff well get this in 1996 at halloween havoc they changed the game here papa smokes with this brand new thought idea wcw championship hollywood hulk hogan against randy savage with miss elizabeth in his corner yeah good lord man he just i don't know going for the nostalgia i suppose right like but yeah, clearly nobody at the top of their game anymore at this point. This is Randy Savage. Like, Randy Savage has had seen a lot of his best matches before he ever went to WWE, too. Like, we've talked about this on other podcasts, too. Uh, uh, these guys, uh, especially once WCW just started signing all the classic old talent, these were guys that, yeah, you know, their best days were behind them, a lot of them, including... Uh, Hogan and Savage, and they had Piper and Warrior and, and everybody basically, but uh, these guys were not at their peaks anymore. So they tried to get something out of them and probably sold a few tickets through it. But for, for looking to the long run, you're not building your audience. You're uh, you're telling them that you're lazy. Basically, you're going to try and work off of old angles and, and old feuds and stuff and. Yeah, sometimes it works, I guess, and sometimes it doesn't, uh, and, and it really didn't turn out too well for WCW in this case. Certainly not, but you know what, 1997, I mean, it was, you know, when you start to look at the un undercards and stuff like that, it's, you know, a lot of big talent, like you say, like, I, I look at, you know, some of the matches on the 97 card, and I see right away, you got Rey Mysterio Jr. against Eddie Guerrero in a title versus mask uh, cruiserweight championship match, like, Already right there. I mean, that's something to go check out. I mean, Eddie Guerrero is pretty much worth checking out in just about anything that the guy ever did in his career. And again, someone the talent of Rey Mysterio as well, too, at the time. I'm sure that is an absolute, you know, barn burner of a match to check out. Absolutely it is. And uh, that, that that's one of the big famous matches from Halloween Havoc history, too, because as we were just talking about... Uh, Old, older, broken-down wrestlers, they they also had some young up-and-comers. And, and that, here's two of them right here, Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio. And then these guys would just go out and do what they knew, which was fast-paced matches with good psychology, with good bumping, good selling, all kinds of offense, all kinds of aerial stuff. And uh, these are two guys who grew up in the wrestling business and, and grew up uh, wrestling each other too so you know they're going to put on a good match and uh, that was one of the things about WCW is that they they never really pushed and developed their their excellent emerging stars as much as they should have including Guerrero, Mysterio, uh, Benoit and Malenko right those were the four that everybody knew were going to be stars and knew were going to be huge even uh, even Jericho and Lance Storm and all that, they had some good guys, but uh, good young guys, but they always stuck them at the bottom of the card and, and they never, uh, they didn't push too many people. They weren't making stars at that point. They were kind of just rehashing off of uh, previous theme from some of these uh, WWF stars. And uh, that was just, uh, it, it might have worked for the short term, but uh, long term, of course, you're, you're cutting the legs out from under yourself and uh i you know with the benefit of hindsight i think what they should have done is, is develop some more of that young talent the uh even the the uh, alex wrights and the uh they had all kinds of uh, cruiser weights and stuff that uh that would look good now in in, in modern wrestling kind of thing they could have developed those guys into uh, good stars but uh, they kind of left them floundering in the on the lower part of the card or the beginning part of each card and uh they you know they the people we mentioned all made made stars out of themselves they got themselves over but uh, they could have been they could have been a lot bigger a lot sooner if uh, wcw management had been a bit more forward-looking 
Oh, certainly. And, you know, I mean, the, you, you're right. The cards ended up getting bogged down by these, you know, rehashed uh, names and stuff like that. And I, I understand from a business perspective, you want to bring these names in in order to try to sell tickets. They're bringing people over and eyes on your product and stuff like that. But unfortunately, it holds back the future of your company at the same time. I've, I've mentioned it before in uh, conversations with you that uh, being that I started as a WWF fan, when Hulk Hogan, who I was a big fan of growing up, uh, when he made that move over to WCW, that was what made me aware of WCW's existence. It made me start to put my eyes over to their product as well, too. Followed him over, but it wasn't, you know, the Hulk Hogan's and Randy Savage's that kept me w keeping my eyes on WCW. I kept tuning in because I started to see, like you said, names like Chris Jericho, Rey Mysterio, uh, Eddie Guerrero, uh, Alex Wright is another name as well, too. You started seeing these guys on the show and thinking to yourself, these are the guys you should be watching out for. Why aren't they, you know, making a bigger deal out of these guys? It it was really frustrating, but I still wanted to tune in as support to those guys because I love the work that they were producing. Yeah, yeah. And I guess then uh, WCW signing Hulk Hogan, brought a bunch of fans that were exactly in your position too that that maybe weren't even aware of the product but a huge you know the hugest name in wrestling at that time hulk hogan moving over there is going to make some huge news so i'm sure for the short term yeah they did get a bunch of uh, young fans who just wanted to uh, see more of their favorites and all that but like we we're saying it, it kind of uh, sells the future on you too so does yeah but then, yeah, you know, when you look at 1998's Halloween Havoc, this was a time where finally the main event wasn't featuring, uh, you know, guys that were made stars in the old WWF days or anything like that. Uh, this actually featured a main event, which, you know, debatably in, you know, a lot of fans' opinions, including my own, was the maybe one and only good time I've ever seen Goldberg in a wrestling ring. Goldberg, the champion versus Diamond Dallas Page, ended up being a very competitive, decent match at the main main event of this uh, Halloween Havoc card. Yeah, I noticed that uh, a lot of people liked that match. I didn't get a chance to watch it yet. Uh, 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 I have my opinions about Goldberg. Like he he was uh, he was green and, and not skilled. He was there for his look, you know, kind of like a, a lot of wrestlers are these days, but. Um, he, he could he fulfilled his position quite well he came out squashed guys very quickly was very intense and uh, and dominating and, uh, and and everybody liked it in the street gimmick and all that too but uh, now come along and put him against uh, a crowd favorite like uh, Diamond Dallas Page another guy who didn't uh, start wrestling until he was in his 30s or something like that and uh, had been a bodyguard and was a big guy with big muscles and big Page was one of those guys that took to the business quickly. He, he understood it quickly, and he, he uh, got the mindset and uh, of how to uh, psychologically work a match in the ring and how to uh, interact with the fans and, and how to sell uh, a gimmick and a character and all that stuff. And uh, so, yeah, it, it's an interesting match. I'm, I'm going to have to watch it. But uh, as I went through uh, – researching for uh, this episode today i noticed that that one is quite highly thought of by a lot of people did, did you watch it again yes i did watch it again and even going back on it it's you know again you're not going to sit there and wow yourself in a sense of going like this is one of the greatest wrestling matches you've ever seen i think yeah. there's a couple of factors that play on this particular matchup one of the factors is the fact that it's like i i'm on the same opinion as you that goldberg was there for his look uh, he was very green. I I just didn't really enjoy Goldberg's move set or anything about his character on a personal basis. I'm not going to knock the guy for the work he put in or what he did or anything like that. I mean, he did as he was asked to do, and he went out there and made a bunch of money doing it. Um, D Dallas Page, on the other hand, I've seen a lot more of his work that I actually enjoy uh, versus, uh, you know, as opposed to what I have enjoyed from Goldberg. But this one particular match... These two seemed to click at the time. It seemed to work decently. Um, it, it was nicely done for considering the competitors involved. You didn't expect to get what you got out of this one. The other factor I'm going to mention that I think plays into it, and maybe 
go and watch these two in order the way they are on the card just so you get a hint of this and i know you we were talking about this before the show went on the air hogan and warrior part two came on just before this match so when you're gonna beat somebody down with some piece of shit like hollywood hogan versus warrior two to the point that you do it you can make almost anything feel like an instant relief right afterwards I mean, it's like putting pe- preparation H on a hemorrhoid. I mean, it just feels better once you got it applied kind of thing. And that's that's Goldberg versus Dallas Page from Halloween Havoc 98, in my personal opinion. Yeah, that's an interesting take on it, yeah. Uh, I'm sure it benefited from its place on the card, too. But like we said, uh, there's some crappy stuff all through uh, WCW and a whole lot of it but like like I was saying before they have a lot of talent in their uh, roster they have some great agents and some great bookers so you know that sometimes they're going to get some good stuff coming out of that too and, and yeah like you say kind of an unlikely matchup between uh, two unlikely heroes but uh, look what can happen when a match is laid out nicely when it's uh, booked really well and when uh, the agents uh, are very clear with them about their spots and where they have to be and what they have to do. And then the wrestlers, uh, you know, maybe they had some uh, chemistry together, those two, who knows? But uh, yeah, it's, it's not all going to be hokey and bad. There's, they're having their good moments too. And uh, it's kind of funny that that's one of them. I, I'm interested to watch that match now. Yep. And then uh, we went on to Halloween Havoc 99, not, a lot much to say about it. Uh, headline with Goldberg and Sting for the championship. Um, earlier in the night, Goldberg defeated Sid Vicious in a match, and Sting had defeated Hulk Hogan, uh, inevitably leading to that one there. So, I mean, it, it, it was what it was. It's not one of the more memorable ones or ones that usually gets brought up a whole lot. And the only reason that uh, Halloween Havoc 2000, which is the final Halloween Havoc in the... Uh, I guess the Halloween Havoc WCW times uh, gets brought up because it simply was the final Halloween Havoc. And that's it. It was headlined with Goldberg taking on uh, Brian Adams and Brian Clark in a handicap match. And it pretty much was a handicap squash match like most Goldberg matches were throughout his entire run. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, I wonder what was going on in the company at that time that uh, they had to pull out a main event like that. Uh, I know those last five uh, were in Las Vegas, taped in Las Vegas, and uh, there are uh, uh, advantages to taping stuff there because it can be cheaper and all that. And and I wonder, uh, I don't know much about that last one. I wonder if the uh, roster was getting pretty thin by that time or if uh, if the company was in shambles. I mean, what time, what year did uh, WCW crumble in finally? I'm forgetting my stuff. 2002 or something like that. Uh, I the purchase uh, must have come around that time, I believe. Or uh, I don't yeah. understand why they wouldn't have done another year of Halloween Havoc. Uh, I am gonna actually just look that up for us right now and find out. We can make this solution known. We need a we need a fact checker for our podcast months and. Uh, Kind of like uh, Rogan has young Janie looking up stuff for him. We need uh, a position like that. Yeah, so uh, let's uh, let's go ahead and say it. If anybody's interested in a non-paying role here on Ring Respect Radio (laughs) as part of the Video Bros Network, uh, we are now taking applications for Fact Checker right here on the show. Uh, You're not even going to pay him on something? Well, you know, I mean, pay him in thank yous or something like that, but, uh, you know... You know, I, I, well, we're not even, uh, you know what? There's no money to be made in the wrestling business. We should know this by now. Anyway, it uh, looks like WCW was actually purchased in 2001. So it would have been prior to Halloween, Halloween Havoc airing in 2001, okay. which is why there's no further Halloween Havocs up until just recently with the NXT brand. So, yes, 2000 ended up being where I guess the company was in shambles. Uh, there was a lot of just really strange matchups on that card in general and just not a whole lot to feature uh, i it, it was pretty obvious i think the company was going under at that point and everybody was starting to expect it maybe didn't expect the purchase of it by wwf at the time but yeah. you know we got what we got it was an interesting time in wrestling history and ever since then people have been left in limbo papa smokes so wrestling fans have called for it for years for some of the resurrection of the old 
WCW themed pay-per-views, including Halloween Havoc. They've been asking for this for a long ass time and they kind of got it just recently with NXT. And I know you said uh, you haven't had a chance to check anything out from this. I'm sure you've probably heard some of the results or things talked about on social media here, but I'm just going to, yeah. I'm just going to run through it real quick. Cause we've, uh, we're running a long time here. I don't want to bore people to death, especially if they haven't seen this and I don't want to put them to sleep with my review of something that just isn't worth the time to invest in. Like this, honestly, I'm sorry to say it. Like I, I like NXT. I like a lot of the competitors over at NXT, but I said to you before going on the air, I wish they would have done this as an actual special event, done it on a Saturday night, anything that they could have done. I mean, goddamn, Halloween was on a Saturday night. I mean, nobody's going out trick-or-treating. Why not put Halloween Havoc on the first ever October 31st event and, you know, really jazz this thing up for some fun and put on a great card? Uh, you know, a lot of people are going to argue with me. I know this. Um, the show started with an NXT North American Championship match, Johnny Gargano and Damian Priest in a Devil's Playground match. I mean, uh, Damian Priest is great. Don't get me wrong. Love Damian Priest. I think he's got a great look. He's got a, everything about him is right. Johnny Gargano. I mean, the guy can work a wrestling match. He is good inside the ring. Um, he's just he's just very very plain. And I just, there's something about it that just doesn't get me excited to invest in Gargano unless he's got a really strong opponent. Here he did, but man, did this thing go on for quite a while. And there was at least two commercial breaks where the picture in picture hit during this match, which I find I can't stand when I'm in a wrestling match. It really takes me out of the action if they have to use the commercial breaks during the actual performances. It, it's not to my liking at all. Yeah, I hate that too. And it also, uh, uh, I haven't, yeah, I've seen picture in picture when uh, a couple of times when I watched AEW and it just, it doesn't interest me. Like I understand that, that sometimes they have to take breaks in the middle of a match, but uh, usually the, the match is set up that you don't miss anything uh, too climactic during the, uh, during the break. And then they'll, sh if you do, they'll show a, they'll show a highlight of it, uh, uh, uh They'll show it on tape, and the commentators will explain and all that. But uh, yeah, not a fan of taking breaks during matches. It, it, it probably means that your match is too long. Like it, I, I'm not trying to tell Vince McMahon and Triple H how to run their stuff. They obviously know better than me. But I still think that matches on TV shouldn't be long enough that it has to go through a break. Some go through two breaks, and. Uh, if you want to have a long match on TV once in a while, that's fine. But uh, these some of these tag matches where they're, it's all involving preliminary talent, and not even just tag matches, singles matches, ladies matches, midget matches, they all go 18, 20 minutes on TV, and that's just too long for one match. I, I don't think the uh, casual wrestling viewer wants to watch a match that long. They want... They want to see it. They want to see what happens. Then they want another one. Then they want another one. Then they want another one. Like, I think you should keep those going on to the kind of six, seven, eight, nine minute mark. And that works better for a TV show, especially then you don't have to go through breaks. But uh, again, I'm not trying to tell the pros how to do it. Maybe there's something I don't understand. But really, from a viewer's standpoint, I, I, I can't get into matches that are just too overly long like that. Yeah, me too. Me too. And like, I mean, it, it has its place. Don't get me wrong, especially on a, you know, a strong pay-per-view type card or something like that. You build to it, oh, you yeah. make it count kind of thing. But again, this was billed as a Halloween Havoc, but it wasn't billed as an actual pay-per-view. It was on network television during the week and 21 minute matchup between these two would have been, I think, better served on a pay-per-view as opposed to during the week like this. I know it's a special event. They're trying to get people interested, but especially... The first match on the card, you're trying to get people, even casual viewers, to tune in. And they got these two guys going at it, uh, beating each other with everything around the ring and outside the ring. Falls count anywhere and stuff like that. And just, it ends up being a real, a bit of a wreck. And then you go and follow it up with, they've got Santos Escobar, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with this guy. He's cruiserweight over there, taking on basically a jobber and a guy named Jake Atlas in a quick uh, one and done type three minute matchup. Yeah, yeah. It's like 
you had so much time for the previous match, but now you're running short and you have to make this match even shorter. I, I, I don't know where the thinking is in this, but uh, it, it sounds like a bit of a mess. Yeah, and I mean, I, I could have gone for a little bit more on Santos Escobar. I'm not... I'm not going to say a huge fan of him yet, but I don't mind this cruiserweight. I, he comes out, he's got an arrogance about him. He's got, you know, his good look, good feel inside the ring. I, I think this guy's on to something. He could be come uh, somebody to watch in the future. Uh, I'm not sure yet. I, I'm not completely sold, but I would like to see more than a three-minute squash match of his and see what he can really deliver over there. Yeah, yeah. everybody's got potential. It's, you know, for depending on what happens in the future, right? Yeah, so then speaking of potential, we, you know, we got young guys in the wrestling world, and you got guys like uh, Cameron Grimes, who I've seen a couple matches of, didn't mind his look, didn't mind what I saw, and then they put him in this thing called a Haunted House of Terror match with Dexter Loomis. And here's where I'm going to let loose, because you know what, this is called Ring Respect Radio, and if it takes place in the ring... We're going to do our best to respect it. But if you're going to pre-tape stuff and make it cinematic, you know what? Game on, motherfuckers, because it's time for me to tell you about how stupid the House of, Haunted House of Terror match was. Because you've got this guy in Cameron Grimes who's supposed to look like kind of a southern guy, like a tough guy, like somebody who looks like he could get in there and be a tough guy. And he is scared shitless, begging for his life in these pre-taped se tape segments with William Regal. And then he's running like a sissy down the streets and looking over every corner and afraid of every time he hears a, you know, a snap of a tree branch or something like that. Because this Dexter Loomis, this weird looking like ripoff of the Dexter TV show guy inside of a wrestling wing is walking around like some horror slasher character or something like that. Just Awful, awful stuff. And it comes to the point where they eventually make their way into the ring. This ends in a submission and makes Cameron Grimes look like an absolute just joke to me. And it has done nothing to sell me on Dexter Loomis. I have zero interest in this guy. I'm not sure who he is. I'm not sure if he can wrestle. Maybe he can. But after seeing this, man, you better do some smartening up going forward. Because otherwise, I'm just not interested. I'm not sold on Dexter Loomis. Wow, that, that was a great review, Munson. And now I know which match not to watch, but uh, I, I know who Dexter Loomis is, or I, I remember him from TNA wrestling. He used to be called Sam Shaw, and he was kind of a creepy stalker-like character on that show, too. And back then, uh, whatever year that might have been, 07, 08, 09, something like that, uh, I remember thinking, he's got a good look, he's big, he was green at that time but maybe looking like he might have potential but uh yeah sounds like he's got uh vince mcmahon's creative on him again and, and what are you going to do when you get a ridiculous uh, uh character like that but you try and make it work i guess right like there are other people that have gotten crap crappy gimmicks like that but the you know some of the great ones make it work like think of somebody else playing the undertaker how that might not have worked you know but you had the right guy with the right character doing it, and uh, it was a smash, but uh, not so with Dexter Loomis by the sound of it, eh? No, I'm not sold. I mean, again, like you said, yeah, big guy, definitely. Um, he's got the right look in that sense, but just, I'm not sold. If this is what they're going for, I'm not sold on it. Again, not knocking the individual behind it. Maybe not his fault. I don't know how much say he has in this whole thing kind of thing sometimes you're just there to do a job and sometimes you got to bite your tongue and do it and try to make it work it doesn't work for me even with what he's done it doesn't work for me i've had enough of cinematic wrestling as much as i tried to defend it before it has its place in small doses just kind of like gimmick matches in general have their place in small doses i just don't feel like i'm into this anymore i don't want to see it i want to get back down to wrestling and that's what i want to see inside of a you know a wrestling ring now is actual wrestling happening and seeing talents get to do what they were trained to do best. Well, yeah, I feel you, Munson. I, I, I'm totally on board with that, but I think uh, I think we're going to be disappointed by that. I think, uh, like we talked about uh, earlier this year on one of our podcasts, uh, I think uh, these kind of movie matches are here to stay. I think they're uh, becoming a part of the new normal for wrestling, uh, including... Uh, firefly fiend matches and uh, uh 
Jeff Hardy horror show matches and swamp matches and, 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 uh, John Cena, this is your life matches. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm not personally a fan. I don't think the, that the uh, wrestling guys are all that talented in making different kinds of, uh, films or different kinds of movies. Like I think they should stick to wrestling, but, uh, I think you and I are probably in the minority on that, and we're going to see a lot more of it to come. Oh, certainly so. But, uh, yeah, from there, this uh, show went on with uh, Rhea Ripley taking on Raquel, Raquel Gonzalez. Uh, not too familiar with Raquel Gonzalez. Yeah, obviously, Rhea Ripley we're both familiar with. I'm a big fan of Rhea's. I think she's got a great look. I think she does really well in the ring. And being that she's at such a young age, I think we haven't even seen the best of her yet which only makes things more exciting moving forward for Rhea's career. A uh, great match to help Rhea continue to look strong in the wrestling business and a great opportunity for Raquel to get some, uh, you know, some notoriety there as well, too. Sure. And uh, talking about Rhea Ripley, I just wanted to quickly bring up how many great Australian wrestlers are coming over and making it big in the States. Prime, uh, mostly, it seems like uh, Australian female wrestlers. Hey, isn't that something uh, that we're getting some great uh, uh, product from down under? Oh, certainly so. But uh, we got to keep in mind that Rhea would be uh, a little offended maybe by the Australian comment. Or is she Australian? No, she is Australian, isn't she? Yeah, I keep. Uh, I'm not I, sure. No, you're is right. You're right. Them? I had to. Hey, I. Fact checker job. I just uh, had to do that again. We got to hire somebody fast here. No, Rhea is Australian. You're 100% right. Papa Smokes is stand corrected okay, on that. I knew she was. I, I kept getting the thought for, for New Zealand for some reason, but no, she's definitely Australian on that one. So. Well, I saw something about that Tony Storm that's in WWE. She's a New Zealander. Uh, and then I guess the Iconics are Australian. And, and uh, no, there's a few more uh, in, in various leagues across there. And uh, they're just turning out some great wrestlers. Oh, certainly. Yeah, there's a lot of great wrestling over there in Australia, as well as New Zealand as well, too. People should be keeping their eyes over to those two countries uh, moving forward because they're just pumping out talent like there's no tomorrow. And we're going to see a lot more of it starting to flood the North American market, especially once all these restrictions with COVID and start to, uh, everything start, uh, start lifting over the years. And then uh, the final match on this NXT Halloween Havoc event, Women's Championship match, Io Shirai defending against Candice LeRae. Uh, tables, ladders, and scares match is what this one ended up being. And I mean... You know, again, with Candice LeRae, much like Johnny Gargano, it's nothing to do with her ability to work a wrestling match or anything in the ring. I just, I, very plain and boring for me. I, I've never been that excited about a Candice LeRae match, to be honest with you. I like Io Shirai. I like her work. I think Io is great. I think she's great as the champion. Uh, I had a sinking feeling this whole time that this is going to go the way of Candice LeRae, and she was going to walk away... Uh, as the new champion, as Johnny Gargano earlier in the night defeated Damian Priest and became the new NXT North American champion. So I kind of figured this was going to be a husband-wife scenario, both winning the uh, championships there. But not the case. Io pulling it off and remaining champion, staying strong as the women's champion to end the night. Uh, and that was pretty much it. That was NXT's version of Halloween Havoc. I'd have to say a little lackluster considering how long people have waited for this opportunity. And just didn't quite have the payoff, I think, that Halloween Havoc could have had if they would have just built this thing a little bit stronger and didn't just slap it together as something to try to beat out AEW in the ratings that week. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> That's what it seems like to me, too, is that uh, they didn't really set it up for uh, months beforehand as like a proper pay-per-view type thing. They just knew that they were going to be having a weekend show around Hell or around. Uh, a midweek show close to Halloween and just decided to use that name since they bought all that stuff and they own it all anyway. I guess they could just use it. But, uh, yeah, a little disappointing. I, I'm kind of hoping in the future that they they spice it up a little bit like WCW did and uh, have some uh, some scary props and some, I, I don't know, like uh, maybe, maybe they should do go the route of some more gimmick matches. Well, it looks like they did have a few on there too, but... Uh, yeah, it just seems like uh, WWE's product is is, is really in the uh, in a low point right now, and I'm not sure if it's 
creative and people are saying Vince is getting too old and all that. I, I think that it's his, uh, instead of having bookers, he has the uh, uh, creative committee and the, he hires TV writers that, that have been writing sitcoms and TV shows for a long time. And uh, they're not wrestling people. They don't understand what the wrestling audience wants and, and how it's traditionally been uh, presented on television. And uh, I, I think that's where the disconnect is coming from, especially with guys like us, uh, the old timer fans that uh, grew up on the good stuff. It, it's, it's hard to, to swallow some of this stuff now. And uh, I had high hopes for, uh, for uh, NXT when it first started uh, under triple H. I, I liked the show and I liked the way it was presented and it looked like a, it looked like you were at a live show kind of thing. And I was thinking, well, maybe this will be the good uh, uh, alternative for me to watch kind of thing. Cause I don't really care for WWE main roster stuff, but it's looking like it's starting to get tepid as well. And uh, I, I just really think COVID's a big part of uh, brutalizing the business right now. And uh, it's hard for anyone to uh, make a splash or make any money. Oh, certainly. I mean, it's just, it, you know, it's all over. But COVID has really been a hard time for everybody. And, you know, there is still a lot of good in there. You know, you just got to flush it out and stuff like that. NXT, you know, on most nights can actually be a very entertaining show, especially when they continue to present it in that way that they used to with, you know, a lot of the names that they have. There's a lot of great talent that they have over there that, you know, should be featured on a regular basis. Uh, I really hope for the best for them. But, I, you know, again, with any wrestling company, I hope the best for them all the time kind of thing. I don't want to see any yeah. wrestling fail for that matter. I mean, we talk about things we dislike. It's not, I, I mean, I should reiterate to the fans, we're not trying to disrespect, you know, the wrestling business. We're not trying to disrespect anything like that when we say we dislike something. It's just our personal opinion. And, you know, when it comes down to it, it's just, you know, we like to see things done a little bit differently and it's probably why guys like you and i have uh grown a love for you know modern stuff from independent companies mlw uh nwa as well because i mean it gives you a, a feel for what we would like to see and what we would like to see these bigger companies catch on to as well too and start to promote a little bit better on that side yeah, and, and any of my personal criticisms, I have the feeling it's the same for you, are, are not meant to be a, a disrespecting of the business. It's out of a risk of a deep respect for the business that I, I want it to do well. I want it to do better. It makes me nervous when it's in the, when it's in a down spot like it is right now. I, I, I had hopes for AEW before I kind of realized what kind of product they were going to feature there but uh I, I still have hope that they'll uh, maybe get it together and maybe put a better product out because then when there's proper competition the the fans win out every time because uh it, it, they just drive each other to make better and better product uh, i hope something like that happens but it's it's really looking bleak right now yeah and i mean i guess it's just the whole COVID times that's what's happened to wrestling and unfortunately that's what we're being served up uh, you know, we were going to, you know, take some time to talk about dark gimmicks on the show, but we've run a long gauntlet here at Pop of Smoke, so I think we're going to uh, maybe just kind of talk about some of the ones we mentioned and stuff like that. You talked about how sometimes the gimmick only works as well as the person behind it, and The Undertaker obviously was going to be a guy that we would talk about heavily when it comes to dark gimmicks, especially dark gimmicks that worked in professional wrestling. Uh, he was just a guy that knew how to sell something that otherwise probably would have come off completely ridiculous if most people were given that opportunity. Yeah, you, if you think about it, like, just on paper, how ridiculous that must have sounded. And poor uh, Mark Calloway trying to keep kayfabe that entire time with, uh, including in public and all that, too. The people were running up to him for autographs, and he had to keep his hat down and keep his face straight and all that stuff. And it couldn't have been easy to do that. And... Uh, he, he was also lucky to have uh, Percy Pringle or, uh, as Paul Bearer alongside him. Uh, that was a guy that, you know, his promos were obviously awesome. He could get you over uh, pretty much no matter what. But uh, him also with a strange gimmick that he wasn't used to also. And uh, he also uh, just, 
just overperformed with that was just so excellent as Paul Bearer. Everybody likes uh, some Paul Bearer. And, uh, yeah, they just a uh, testament to their professionalism. They made it work, and uh, that's some of the greats have made it work with the questionable gimmicks. Well, and then uh, the dirt gimmick of Kane was introduced by, you know, Percy Pringle, Paul Bear as well, too, and Glenn Jacobs able to not only pull that off, but uh, carry it down that path of having a lot of fans still at the time believe that he legitimately was the brother of The Undertaker. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, I was thinking of some other uh, interesting uh, horror-type gimmicks from the past, including, uh, you know, just some of the guys were were just being uh, slashers out of the movies. Uh, do you remember Leatherface? He was, uh, he, he just took the character right from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But I was just, I never realized who Leatherface was. He, he did the, uh, he was, uh, uh, did some, a lot of kind of uh, gimmicky matches and such, had a lot of runs in Japan, had the, the, uh, chainsaw without the chain revving that up around ringside and it was pretty interesting but you know who played that guy uh on some leather face was a uh, was a uh, corporal kirshner you remember who he was he was from the 80s wwf uh, sergeant slaughter had a little crony for a while like a, a corporal i guess a, a young tough military guy that was a face in WWE and he was Corporal Kirshner and uh, he didn't last very long. I don't even think he was there for a year. I'm not sure what happened, but it was that guy that ended up playing the leather face. I, I never knew that before. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I do remember that now that you bring it up, I didn't uh, prior to that, but as soon as you mentioned it, I'm like, okay, yeah, no, I knew, I uh, realized who we we're talking about now at that point. And, yeah, I mean, Leatherface, obviously a gimmick taken right out of the movies, but introduced it in wrestling as well, too, there. And, uh, you know, speaking of which, I mean, we could we could go as far as saying that uh, Chucky from Child's Play made an appearance in the old WCW as well, too, yeah. as a uh, promotion yeah. for his uh, Bride of Chucky movie that was coming out at the time. <laughs> that was an obvious one, eh, to have a uh, midget play Chucky. That's, a, that's quite hilarious. Yeah. But, uh, you know, an interesting fact, and this is uh, wrestling related too, is that uh, Saskatoon's very own Tyler Maine, former professional wrestler, uh, actually appeared in the uh, reboot of Halloween, uh, the Rob Zombie reboot of Halloween and Halloween 2. Tyler Maine actually as Michael Myers in those two movies. Oh, wow. And yes, oh, uh, right, out of, right out of Saskatoon, and he wrestled in the old uh, WCW days. Uh, some people... I don't know if anyone's going to remember him, but uh, Sky High Lee, Sky High Walker, uh, Skywalker, or even just as Tyler Maine as well, too. Uh, he was, uh, back in those days, very big dude, 6'9", 295 pounds. Yeah, right right from here in Saskatoon, and he's still strong in the movies. He's, you know, played in the, uh, the X-Men films uh, back in the day. He was uh, Sabretooth in the X-Men oh, films okay. there, yeah, and then uh, worked his wow. way into the Halloween movies. He's buddies with uh, Rob Zombie, and that's why even when Rob Zombie was in town here, he mentioned about how uh, Saskatoon had a special place in his heart because his buddy Tyler Mayne was from here. Well, how interesting. I never knew any of that stuff. Yeah, so, and speaking back on dark gimmicks, I mean, guys can make them work. Uh, then we can have debates over whether or not uh, a character works, and I mean, no better person to debate this uh, topic on just briefly here and talking about a more modern guy in uh, Bray Wyatt, who's had two dark characters that he's played since coming into the WWE spectrum, uh, both as these kind of a uh, cult leader and stuff in the Wyatt family, which are very reminiscent of uh, Dan Spivey's Waylon Mercy from back in the 1990s. <laughs> And then also, more modernly, The Fiend, which, I mean, this one could be very controversial because there's a lot about The Fiend that could work, and yet it's gone, in my opinion, completely downhill in recent times. Yeah, I, I when I first saw The Mask and I heard that uh, Bray Wyatt was reinventing himself in WWE, I, I was looking forward to it. He, he, I, I liked his hillbilly gimmick, and I thought... Uh, I was excited to see the new thing, and it's left me completely cold, uh, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I would argue that uh, a similar but better gimmick from the recent past in WWE was the Boogeyman. 
Yeah, you know what? That one was just fun in general. And I have him written down here. I mean, the guy behind it, I mean, he just, he lives this character and he's taken it to all sorts of extremes. And it's one of those ones that was so ridiculous, but he's made it memorable at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, There's the famous story of uh, he lived in uh, somewhere in Tennessee uh, in past years, uh, the boogeyman, uh, and he uh, he had a bunch of, uh, he was living in a hotel, and he had a bunch of uh, aquariums with all dirt in them and all those worms, or his, uh, obviously his worms gimmick, and he left them in there and went on tour for a month. And I'm not sure what happened, but something went wrong uh, with his uh, tanks and all the worms completely infested the hotel. <laughs> when he got back, <laughs> he had a big mess on his hands and a big bill on his hands because uh, they just, yeah, something happened. The window broke or something, and then all the worms got out and uh, infested <laughs> the whole hotel. I thought that was pretty funny. What a crazy character. And yet, you know, sometimes the talent behind the character, even if the character is ridiculous, doesn't always work out too. And I mean, you can always look back to the 1990s with the experiment with Papa Shango. Um, A very interesting character, maybe to say the least, but something that just kind of fell flat at the same time. I don't think that at all there was enough interest in the character in general. It just didn't end up working. And then it kind of just fell flat once he was uh, put into his little... Uh, feud with the Ultimate Warrior at the time. Yeah, they, I thought Papa Shango was a good character like that. I really thought he looked good. I liked his uh, kind of uh, skull that he brought out that had the uh, smoke coming out of it. And uh, I, I base a lot of that stuff on what the uh, the reaction of the fans. Uh, I was in a couple of live crowds uh, in the past with uh, Papa Shango on the card and uh, I always like to see people's reactions to certain characters and uh, just seeing the fear of the, of the smaller children in the crowd and the, the crying and the hugging of mom and dad and the hiding of the eyes like that. To, to me, that's a, that's a true indication of uh, whether you've gotten your scary uh, character over or not. And, uh, you know, to, to help the adults in a case like that, a, a character like that is meant to scare little kids. And uh, we probably, uh, I'm sure everybody had the wrestlers that they were scared of when they grew up. For, for me, it was uh, uh, Abdullah the Butcher and uh, the Sheik, like the old Sheik from Detroit, uh, just for their violence, like, the, and they the, playing the, the crazy uh, lunatic that's obsessed with violence, and uh, Abdullah is eating that raw chicken and eating the raw fish heads and everything. And, as a kid, I was just terrified of him. Every time he saw him, he was covered in blood, and he was brutalizing some opponent in the ring. And uh, yeah, the, the, despite whatever thoughts I had about wrestling, I, I knew I was uh, terrified of Abdullah the Butcher. And then the same thing with Papa Shango and uh, and maybe the Fiend and some of these other characters now. But uh, I always look to the kids. I want to see what kids are crying and what kids are uh, hiding their eyes and hugging mom's. Uh, dress and then all the rest of it uh, that's the indicator for me and you know and you say the fiend and he might be if strike of fear and the kids were not 100 percent sure because hasn't been that much opportunity to see in front of a live crowd but i do know in talking to some fans who have little kids that watch wwe regularly have said on multiple occasions their kids will leave the room or have the parents turn off the tv if the fiend comes on the screen because they're actually afraid of him when he's in costume, when he's doing his thing. So, I mean, that again, it must be clicking in that sense, which is good to see. And you mentioned with Papa Shango that uh, you were seeing kids uh, crying and scared and getting their eyes covered at the time. And I think back to the time, because I would have been a, a young kid of myself at the time, and I, I'm one sick bastard because I must have been desensitized. It wasn't that he wasn't scary or anything like that. It was just... I think at the time I was already invested into watching horror movies on television and everything. So I was enjoying the bad guys. I liked the darkness and everything like that. So, I mean, it was right up my alley. I had fun with it. It's just one of those things that it just didn't last. I guess it wasn't pushed to its full potential maybe. Or maybe just not enough interest in the character. Especially, I mean, the whole when it got down to the thing with the Ultimate Warrior. I think it just kind of fell flat with everything that fell flat when it went up against the Ultimate Warrior. Yeah, it did, I think. And I 
I also think, uh, I can't remember the exact uh, specifics of the whole thing, but I think they were they were desperate for a main event heel at that time. I, somebody must have left or, or gotten injured or something. I can't remember, but they kind of had to stick uh, Papa Shango into that spot and just maybe it wasn't the right time or maybe the guy wasn't ready for that or uh, whatever the circumstances might have been. Yeah, yeah. It, they got a run out of it with some main events and everything, but uh, not, not terribly memorable in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, and I mean, at the time, WWF, WWE were actually trying a lot of different gimmicks and stuff like that, and it seemed like they would uh, immediately push these guys right into the spotlight and stuff like that and see if they could hold their own there. And, you know, I mean, at that time, WWF wasn't really exactly making the profits that they would come the Attitude Era and everything like that. So a lot of these gimmicks, they were trialed, and when they didn't bring in the dollars, were maybe just killed off just as fast as they came in, too. Yeah. So, but with that said, I mean, uh, this has been a very dark episode of Ring Respect Radio, to say the least, Papa Smokes, but one of the most entertaining and fun ones I think we've ever done. Uh, we're running uh, quite a long time here, so I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, any last things you want to mention here on the show? No, no, it's been a good talk. Uh, I Just like you, Munson, I like the darkness too, so uh, I, I like a discussion about uh, horror-themed stuff in wrestling. Perfect. Well, once again, Bob Smokes, thanks for being on the show, part of the show, everything you do. I appreciate it. And thanks again to all the fans who tune in and continue to support everything that Papa Smokes and I do here on the Video Bros Network and also all our work with Prairie Pro Wrestling. I'm going to mention one more time at the top of the, or the end of the show here that Prairie Pro Wrestling and the Saskatoon Fantastic Film Festival will be, will be presenting the nail in the coffin, the fall and rise of Vampiro on Saturday, November 14th, 7 p.m., Broadway Theatre. Hopefully all the fans that are available that can be there and, and come in wearing your masks, because mask mandatory now in Saskatoon. Uh, come on down, check out the show, and just once again, be a part of the wrestling community. Uh, we miss the hell out of you, and we're looking forward to being able to see some of the familiar faces that we got so used to at our live PPW shows. Once again, everybody, thanks for tuning in to the show. Go ahead and hit the like and subscribe. And we'll see you again next time right here on Ring Respect Radio.